praise your heart out, Lord. Let me live one more day so I can get the Holy Ghost. You know, but you know, it's different when you get that Holy Ghost. You keep that reassurance, you know, that you, when they happen, you're going to, you know where you're going. But Dan, you want to come and testify? Glad to be counting you again. <laughs> Hallelujah. I was reading this morning, and uh, I was I was reminded of something. I, I guess I haven't really paid that much attention to it. I was reading about the, the pool of Bethesda. You know, that was the place where the angel would come down every so often and would trouble the waters. You know. And, Whoever got the water first, they'd be healed. And I was reading there, of course, you know, the man that was lame and, you know, invalid for what, 38 years, I think it was. Been laying there all that time. And Jesus walks up to him. You know, Jesus always shows up when, when you know, we, we, we're just about to give up. We don't say a whole lot about that old boy, but he said, you want to be whole. And we know that guy was having problems because he said, you know, I want to, but every time that the water's trouble, when I go to get in, I don't have anybody to help me. When I go to get in that water, somebody beats me in there every time. I just can't get there quick enough to get my healing. And Jesus said, take up thy bed. <laughs> Behold. And the man stood up. 38 years he'd been laying there. 38 years he'd been in a predicament he couldn't do nothing about. And it only took just one meeting to Jesus. And it changed the whole situation. Hallelujah. We, we can... We can look it around and think, man, I've been in this for so long. I've been, this has been happening for so long. I just don't know how I'm ever going to get out of it. All it takes is just one meeting. Just one chance encounter with the Savior. And everything can be changed. You know why he said, I, I was thinking about that this morning. I was sitting there looking at it and and it was funny, Brother Kevin, because, you know, the Jews got on to him. He said, hey, you're not supposed to carry your bed on the yeah. Sabbath day. Uh -huh. Why did Jesus say, take up thy bed and walk? Uh -huh. Think about that. He was saying, go ahead and get whatever you got here because you ain't coming back no more. Go ahead and pick up that thing that you learned it was your spot, it was your place. Go ahead and pick it up and take it out with you because you won't be bad. They said, wait a minute now. That ain't right. That's against the law. You're not supposed to work on this day. You're not supposed to do anything. He said, look here, I'm sorry, but I've left this old problem behind. I've left this old situation. This man, who was it? I don't know. Whoever it was, he told me to get up, and I did. So now I'm not going back to where I was at. I'm going on. I'm going to something back no more. Mighty God. What a God we serve. Just remember. If there's a situation that you're in, something has come up, and you just feel like I, it don't look like I'm ever going to get out of it. Just one chance encounter with the Savior can change it all around. That can bring you into a victorious place. Hallelujah. So just remember, lean on Him. Look for Him. Strive for Him. Uh, I love the Lord tonight, and I'm glad to be here with you. Praise the Lord.
hurting. And I haven't got away with it yet from it ever since Monday night. So y'all just bear with me. Because Sister Victoria got y'all said very funny. <laughs> but I'm going to read. He's still going to preach. I'm not doing this time. I'm all still preaching. <laughs> I just got a little, I guess you say, little sermon here. But it's Isaiah 6, 6 through 8. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongue from off the al- tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. This is the scripture that stuck out to me. Also I heard a voice, the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. You know, we've been talking about all this, you know, so being keen to mind, so winning, and this, this scripture just grabbed at me. I'd heard it done before and I don't, I hadn't heard it, read it in a while but sitting there with Brother Thomas so that Monday, Monday night I ran back to Kevin and I said, what's that scripture that says here am I, send me? And we started searching but God when I was Monday morning praying, the scripture came back to me so I was like, okay. He gave me these three points, three little things to go by in the Bible. We're about to send me. Here am I, send me. Different people has been called. Some's listened. Some's ran away. Some's just not done what they're supposed to do. They're still sitting in the church and they're still being called, but they're just ignoring it. And one of them was, are you willing to obey God or are you going to disobey Him? Now, Gen- and Abraham, I want to use the people in the Bible. Abraham was willing to obey God. You know, God woke him up one morning and told him to take Isaac and sacrifice him. That took some obeying. I don't know if anybody, if it's, you know, their only child. And you know, Isaac kept asking the whole time, you know, we've got the fire, we got this, but where's the sacrifice? And they get there, and he binds him up. He lays him down, and he's fixing the sacrifices. God 
God's told us to do something, we don't do it. Finally, when he pulls your number, you got to say, hey, my Lord. You know, we don't need to do that. But some of us do. There's people that does it because they just don't want to do it. They think that they can just sit on the pew and just slide right into heaven. But it ain't going to work that way. We've got a work to do for God. We might not know what it is. And I thought for you, but never thought I'd be up here doing it. <laughs> no. But our next one is, are you willing to go or are you going to run away? Moses went. Yes, he did. I can't talk very good. I can't say my words right. And I've used that. I say I just keep, this is all on me because I've got up there and I said, God, I can't talk. I get up here. I get so nervous. I can't read. The, I can read really good, but I can't comprehend what I read. And he says, that's just an excuse. He says, I gave you a help me to help you understand all that. Just like he told Moses, I'll give you somebody to help you talk. Help you talk. Just go. You know, just go. And he went. And he did what God told him to do. And he brought his people out of slavery. We need to be willing to go when God tells us to go out there and knock on the doors. Because we're bringing those people out of slavery. Slavery of the world. Slavery of getting the slave master of the devil off of them. We've got to get them out of slavery so they can get in here and experience that whole joy unspeakable. And you know how it feels that you've got somebody when you feel like you ain't got nobody that loves you. You've got God that always loves you. And then the next one, are we going to be like Jonah? He ran away. But he's still in the time to do what God told him to do. He got punished for it. Has it been three nights, three days and three nights in the belly of the wind. Fish, well, yeah, the belly hell, yeah. So, and then he still ended up having to do what God told him to do. That's it all. We can't run away from it. We can try. And there's people that has came through this and then they left. All they're doing is running. They're not trying. They say that they're, they're running because they know, number one, they know what's right. And number two, they knew that they were fixing to have to do some work to do, and they didn't want to do it, so they just ran. Right. And that's, we don't need to run, because like you said, God's going to get you. God's got our number, and he's going to eventually make us go through some things that brings us back. Amen. And last one, are you willing to hear the voice of of God. I mean, we can muffle our ears and say, no, 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 no. I have one of your kids and your mom was talking a lot of them. Mine's never done it and I've never done it to mine, but I've seen other kids put their fingers in the air like, I can't hear you, I can't hear you. And that's why sometimes we do to God when we're, he's trying to talk. Uh -huh. We stick those cotton balls in our ear or our fingers and we're saying, I can't hear you. But we need to be like Samuel. When he went and woke up like Eli uh -huh. over and over again, and Eli finally told him, that's God that waking you up. Right. Right. And when the last time he said, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth you, yeah. that's the heart we need to have, is that when God tells us, God's calling us, we need to say, I'm listening. Where do you want to see me? And we don't know what our job is going to be. We've got to, but we pray about it. It might be a musician in the church. You know, that's a, a, a ministry. It might be a Sunday school teacher, a youth leader. And it might just be God wants us to pray a little bit harder. Every morning, every evening, every night. God just might want you to be a prayer warrior. You might think, I can't do that. I can't play an instrument. I can't teach Sunday school. Well, I said that I couldn't do Sunday school, and God put that in my life. But okay. 
I did it. <laughs> and as Kevin told me the other night, God don't call the qualified. He called, He qualifies you. Right. Right. Because I, I had said, I wasn't even teaching Mandy. My mama was teaching her. I scared to death to even pick up a book and teach her because I was afraid, no, 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 no. Well, October, we came here, and that got my lap. Well, it was December when Mom had to go to work after Daddy passed away. I had to start teaching Mandy. God knew what he was doing, but I had learned to say, I ain't going to do it because you're going to end up doing it. God will tell, God will say, mm-hmm. You're going to do it. All right. He's going to find a way, some way, <coughs> to get you to do it. The, the, either the easy way or the hard way. Right. I'd rather do it the easy way. Right. Man, like I said, this has been on my toes the whole time I was doing it. Because there's been times I get back there and I'll be at the sound booth and I'll be praying and God will say, you need to say such and such and such. I won't say what's right. They won't understand what I'm saying. And I'll just, I won't. I'll just get up and say, and then when I get back there, it's like, boom, boom, I told you to say that. Because if I don't say it, then it'll be Sister Nancy gets up. She says the same thing I was supposed to say. She got my blessing for it. Or Brother Kevin will get up and say it. And I finally, I learned, you do what God says. And I know that maybe somebody got anything out of that tonight. Because I want to hear. I want to be willing to go when he says go. And Sunday we talked about the youth getting out one Sunday afternoon before church, after church. And we're going to have a game night. We're going to go around we're going to knock on doors and to invite kids to come down here for game night. And my kids were all Oh, yeah, that's good. Let's do it. Let's do it. I was their age, and they talk about knocking on doors. I mean, I'll, I'll stay home. But it ended up different. But I'm glad they got the willingness to do it. Because if somebody would have instilled it at me at their age, I might not have been so scared at my age that I am now. I mean, me doing up here what I did, I had to fight a battle when Kevin told me that I needed to get up and do it. I had to fight a good, good battle. So I got it. Because my daddy was a flat out women didn't get up and say nothing behind the pulpit. You could sing, you could play the instruments, but you didn't say nothing behind this pulpit if you was a woman. But, and I had to battle that because even though he was gone, I still had that in that in my head, that fear in my head. Finally that night my sister Susan Russian was here preaching. And I had that got that lesson. That devil left me on that. And I felt the uh, freedom of being able to get up here and say what God gives me. Not say what I want to say. But say what he wants to say. And then you don't need to just get up and say what you want to say, because you don't even want to tell them what's gonna come out when you say what you're gonna say. Right. Yes. You say what God wants to say. And make sure you say, here am I. Send me or use me. I'm missing. Uh, give me the <coughs>
make a flop, it ain't his fault. But if y'all get anything out of this, make sure you give God glory for it. Turn to Genesis chapter 6. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil, continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Let's pray. Another one of my favorite. 
favorite verses in the Bible, Psalms 51 and 10. And David said, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Yep. And in Proverbs 20 and 9, it says, Who can say, I have made my heart clean? I am pure from sin. And then the next verse says, Diverse weights and diverse measures. Both of them are like abomination to the Lord. Even a child is known by his doings, whether his works be pure and whether it be right. The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord hath made even both of them. So I want to go back to for a second to Genesis chapter 6 and verse 6. He had just got done noticing the condition of man's heart. And when God made man, he said he made him in his image. The image of God created him and the man and created him. But right here when it says it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, it also says, and it grieved him at his heart. So the condition of man directly affects God's heart. It's very important that we understand that God has a heart too. He has a heart. And he has that heart and he wants to impart his heart to you. He wants to give you that heart. There's plenty of places in the Bible. I tried to research this by just typing in the word heart. And there's 400 and something times in the Bible where it says the word heart. It's in the Bible a bunch of times. So the condition of the heart is very important to God. So we need to know what condition He wants our heart to be in. So that's what I'm going to try to endeavor to teach here tonight. To have our hearts healthy. To have a healthy heart. We have to first recognize the condition of ours. And we have to be able to see what God's heart looks like. So at, at first we look in Proverbs chapter 20. And we find out that it's not possible for us to clean our own heart. And it's not possible for us to purify ourselves. Because diverse weights and diverse measures, both of them are a combination to the Lord. Which means... Anything that we would measure ourselves by down here is not going to be an accurate measure. That's one reason why that scripture in the Bible that says, don't compare yourself among yourselves if it's not wise, is because that's a diverse weight and diverse measure. Because your idea of what right is and my idea of what right is may differ slightly. But are we balanced with God's idea of what's right? Because his balance is sure. So whenever we're looking, like it says in verse 12, and whenever we're hearing, God made the hear and ear and the see and eye. So we recognize by those things that God has made, there's something a little bit off about this. Unless we've been shaded by the condition of our heart and then we see the way we want to see and like in, in the Bible it says our hearing gets dull and our seeing gets dim in Matthew, 20, Matthew 13 and 15 is where I'm going there for this people's heart is waxed gross and their ears are dull of hearing and their eyes they have closed he said, their ears are dull of hearing, but their eyes, they have closed. Lest at any time, they should see with their ear, eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their hearts, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Now, what, what the problem is, is in Jeremiah chapter 17 and 9, the heart is deceitful 
above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart, try the reins. We heard something about the reins. Yeah. I, the Lord, search the heart, and I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. But what chance is there that we're going to manage to give that much fruit to God without Him handling the reins? Without Him giving us some direction? In Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 3. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, This is the first step. This right here is going to be the first step. To fix in our heart condition. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem. Break up your fallow ground. And sow not among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. And take away the foreskin of your heart. Ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Lest my fury come forth like fire. And burn that none can quench it. Because of your evil doings. <coughs> So we find here that our job, even though we can't really help the condition of our heart, is we can allow ourselves to be pliable in the hands of God. We can we can till it up so that it's a little bit softer and a little more ready to receive what God has for us. That God's expecting of us to do. Because he can, he can throw seed at you. He can send people to help you, and they can throw seed at you. But the condition of your heart is what's going to determine whether or not you're going to receive it. And even though you can't keep your heart from being evil and wicked and deceitful, you can keep it pliable. You can make it to where it can receive. And what you do is you keep, keep yourself ready to receive something from God. This is good even after you've entered the kingdom. This is good before and it's good after. This is something that we can do. We can allow ourselves to be ready to receive. That's why it says we must become as little children in order to enter the kingdom. Because we have to be ready to be seated. We have to be willing to say, I'm not going to allow this in my life. And I'm going to try my best to keep myself away from distractions. And try my, try my best to keep myself away from the cares of this life. And I'm not going to get so involved with things that I can't allow anything else to come into my mind. you got to keep it open for God. Give Him a channel to use. At least give Him one channel to use. we got a bunch of channels. Have, have you ever done any research on the human brain? Of how little of it we actually use? And all, of, all we have to do in order to allow another channel to be opened up in our brain for memory, for retention, is to just change our routine by just a little bit. And it opens up a new avenue. So what happens if in all of our doings, we decide, I'm going to set aside this time to pray, and I'm going to set aside this time to read my Bible. Then you've just opened up a channel to God for Him to fill and that's a furrow that he can start to plant things in. And whenever that starts to grow, that can start filling up your garden of your heart. And that can cover the whole ground of your garden of your heart. But you got to be willing to give him some of it. Of course, eventually what he really wants is your whole heart. But we can give him some of it to start with. It, it, it's definitely a good start. <clears throat> For thus saith the Lord, break up your fallow ground, and sow not among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord, and take away the foreskin of your heart. And in Hosea 10, it says, Sow to yourselves righteousness, and reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord. Till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Because what we've been doing 
in this world, like Felicia was saying, those people don't know no better. They've been plowing in wickedness and reaping iniquity. They've eaten the fruit of lies. They don't know the truth. They've eaten the fruit of lies because thou didst trust in thy way and the multitude of thy mighty men. But we, we normally, whenever we're raised up in this world, we don't know who is right and who's wrong. So we just swallow whatever is given to us. So we end up plowing wickedness and reaping iniquity. Because we've eaten the fruit of lies, and the fruit of lies has seed in it. And the seed that comes in from us eating the fruit of lies starts to grow in us and produces a bad way of thinking. And that causes us not to recognize truth. But what happens, though, is when we come to a place, and God will make sure that we get there, because he wants an opportunity to be able to work with us. We'll end up getting to a place that our way will end up bottoming out. Our way will end up crossing paths with something we can't handle. And then when that happens, God's opportunity. And he don't miss opportunity. He'll send somebody whenever you get there. And whenever you get to that place, God sends somebody to you. And then all that has to happen is you have to be willing to receive. Right. And when you receive, then you begin to sow yourselves in righteousness. And he said you'll reap in mercy. Right. Mercy is what we're looking for. Amen. So when he begins to sow that righteousness, you begin to recognize righteousness, and then he begins to give you mercy. In Jeremiah chapter 4 and 14. O Jerusalem, wash thine heart from wickedness, that thou mayest be saved. How long shall thy vain thoughts lodge within thee? Mm -hmm. So we get to the place then, after he's already started pouring out righteousness and giving us mercy. We have to be willing to allow him to wash out those vain thoughts that have lodged within us. So we have, to, we have to look at the thing that is being shown to us. And we have to be able to truly believe that this is not of the world. This is not the same as what I've been eating. This is not the same fruit that I've been eating. This is something that tastes good. This is something that I want to believe because this is so much better than what I've been eating. This is so much better than what I've been receiving then we have to allow him to wash those vain thoughts out of our garden. Those that have lodged in our garden and started to grow. Then after that, we got to recognize those things that have been washed out and say, I don't want that growing again. We don't want to go back and start eating of the same stuff that we just got washed out. Let's get it all out. So in Acts chapter 8 and 19... It says, saying, give me also this power. This guy is Simon, the sorcerer. He was still in the, the evil heart condition. Yes. Uh -huh. And he had the idea that this was all just a hyped up thing that he might be able to gain some things from. So he said, give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with you. Because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. God's not for sale. Right. There is a scripture that says buy the truth and sell it not. But it ain't talking about money. Like I said before, whenever we go to build on this, we got to give ourselves to it. So he said, God made the gift, he, he, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. In verse 21 it says, thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. For thy heart is not right in the sight of God. It's a heart condition. See, Simon didn't know he had a heart condition. 
Simon thought, well, this is an opportunity. I'm going to get to increase myself by using this power also with what I already have. But God said, no, you're going to have to get rid of what you have and let me wash it all out. Then I might let you use what I got. Because I'm not growing this in the same garden with what you got. And here's the reason why. In verse 22, it says, Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And what was it that we just got finished talking about? You go back for a second. Did y'all remember seeing that in, in Hosea chapter 10? Where it says, ye have plowed wickedness and have reaped iniquity? See, put, putting two and two together is what, what we're supposed to do in the Bible. It tells here that Peter had perceived that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. So iniquity is a bond. Iniquity can have you bound. Right. If you sow wickedness, then iniquity will try to bind you. So once we have come into the kingdom, and once we have started producing good fruit, if we turn around and start sowing iniquity, then if we start sowing wickedness, then iniquity will try to bind us. And that keeps us from being what God wants us to be. And then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me that none of these things which he has spoken come upon me. I'm not sure if he ever got his heart right. Because it didn't sound like he wanted to pray for his own situation. It sounded like he was hoping somebody else would take care of it for him. And God don't really do things that way. The only person that ever did it for us was Jesus. And he said, I'll go with you all the way. But there's going to be some things you're going to have to carry. There's going to be some things that you're going to have to do. And if I learned anything from the book of Job, it's you can't sacrifice for somebody else's sins. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus was talking in verse 34. He said, O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. It's a heart condition. And God and a good man, out of the good treasure of the heart, bringeth forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account, therefore, in the day of judgment. In, verse, in chapter 15 of Matthew, it says, in verse 18, but those things which proceeded out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceeded evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, and blasphemies. These are things that we sometimes allow to be planted in our garden. And whenever they're planted there, what kind of fruit's going to show up? What kind of things are we going to talk about? In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So there is a pure heart. It's not ours. It's not ours. Our heart's not pure. In Matthew chapter 6, it says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So there's a treasure we got to find. I don't know what the treasure is. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 24, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your soul. There's a yoke, but it's, 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 not, it's not a heavy yoke. And it's going to give us rest for our soul. But we got to be meek and lowly. Which means we can't be high and haughty. Which is our natural tendency as human beings. 
Look at me. I've made it. I've done something for myself. Everybody, everybody around me is a little lower than I am. I feel like I'm better. Or you may not even say it. And in that, you might feel justified. <laughs> because it's the abundance of the heart. It's a heart condition. Now, I want to talk for a few minutes on what the heart actually is. I feel like whenever I was growing up, I really didn't know what the heart actually was. And I was so confused every time somebody quoted a scripture about the heart. The reason why is because whenever you read the scriptures about the heart, you need to understand that what the Bible is actually talking about is your emotional processes. Your thought processes that are guided by the emotions. But the thing that we don't understand, and, and it's so easy for us to overlook, is how we react to things. We think is just our uh, our personality. That's another term that we've given it. It's our personality. We don't really think there's anything wrong with the way we think. The majority of the time, we don't, we don't think there's anything wrong with the way we think. We don't even notice sometimes whenever something is happening and, and we get a little uptight and we start thinking, well, I don't think they should have said that. And I was talking to a brother today. It's, there's five things that God hates. One of them is selling discord among the brother. Well, the one thing that we don't recognize and we probably should be a lot more patient, a lot more meek. But whenever somebody else is sowing discord, it's so easy to begin to sow discord. Because discord begets discord. Gossip begets gossip. In fact, the only answer for gossip is I don't want to hear that. Because any other answer is a continuation of gossip. But that's a heart condition. And we think, well, they're just the gossipy type. I think there's a scripture in the New Testament where it talks about, I'm not trying to pick on women, but it does talk about the women that go about being busybodies in other men's matters. That's a, it's not just a personality trait. It, it's a heart condition. And it's so in discord. Whenever we feel like it's a good idea to talk about other people's problems, it's a heart condition. Because the only one we should be talking to about it is God. Because he's the one that's got everything in his hands. And if it's going to be fixed, it's going to have to be fixed from the heart. Because if you try to go heart to heart with somebody, your emotions are going to clash with their emotions. And that's the reason why the Bible says specifically, whenever you have an issue or you find that a brother has an issue, the only way to go to them is in the spirit of meekness. Because they have to recognize that you're in a position to help them. Because you can't go to them with that high and mighty I'm better than you attitude and expect to do any good. Of course, there are certain situations where the condition of the heart is deteriorated so bad that there's no possible way you can go to them. And it's not going to do any good. You're going to have to wait until their heart condition is rectified by them. They're going to have to come to a place that they've tilled up their fallow ground and got a little bit of that flesh off of the top of the heart. So God can reach down and touch that heart. And that's what he was talking about with that scripture that I was talking about a while ago about circumcising the heart. Because we got to get the flesh off of it. So that it's just it's just heart. It's open heart right there. Because we got to have an open heart surgery. God don't want to have to pilfer through all the things that we think and all the things that we've accumulated to try to get all this stuff out. 
of course, the, the word of God is quick and powerful. And it's sharper than a two-edged sword. Even to the piercing and dividing of soul and spirit. This is this is actually where I'm at. I got that scripture right here. For the word of God is quick and powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. And of the joints and marrow. And is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And I feel like sometimes we feel justified in ourselves. I have before. I felt justified in myself because I felt like God knew what my intention was. He also knows what your condition is. And even if your intention is pure, your condition still may be wrong. And he still wants you to work on your condition. Even if your intention is right, you can cause trouble. Because our condition may be wrong. In Matthew 22, verse 37, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. That doesn't leave any space or any room for anything else. So if we're really going to do that, then we're going to have to not love ourselves. And not love our things. And not even love our life. Because the scripture also says that he that loves his life shall lose it. And he that hates his life shall save it. The only way we're going to make it is for the flesh to die off the heart so we can have that open heart surgery. But what causes that? It's in Acts chapter 2 in verse 37. There comes a time whenever we see our heart condition. There comes a time whenever we recognize that we have a heart problem. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, it says, Now when they heard this, they heard they had a heart problem. They were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now, since the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, it'll force you to recognize you got a heart problem. But when we recognize we got a heart problem, and we get pricked in the heart because it's going to happen, we got to be willing to say, what, what are we going to do about this? And we got the answer right here. We got to be willing to let him do an open heart surgery. And that requires blood. And that requires water. And that requires the word of God, which is the sword that does all the work does all the cutting and all the rearranging. And once we've had that blood transfusion, and once we've had that washing, and once we've had that flesh cut off, then we can receive that new heart. But there's a there's a test you can do. In first John chapter three and eighteen. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. 
Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. Now, what happens when we have confidence towards God? If we don't have a heart problem and we have confidence toward God, then whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because he, we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. So we understand what he's saying there is the condition of our heart has a whole lot to do with whether or not we're going to get what we need from God. Not only that, but once you've come into the kingdom, if we don't really love our brother, if we don't, we just say we do. That's what John is saying here. It's a test of the heart. If we don't really love our brother and all we're doing is just saying we do, then we're not going to receive answers to our prayers. Because we don't have confidence towards God. Because we lose our confidence with our heart problem. We lose our confidence with our heart problem. And, and whenever I heard this, I thought about faith. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But it only really works if you have your ground healed up, and you don't have a heart problem. And if it gets in your heart, and you believe it, which you should do, uninhibited then anything that you ask in faith believing God does it because you don't have that heart problem holding you back if we believe that God's got something for this church and we don't we don't have a heart problem then we should have confidence and I want to sing that song I have confidence because we have enough confidence that we don't have a heart problem and God's going to do what he said he's going to do because we've all received the Holy Ghost we've all been baptized in Jesus name. and we love our brothers and our sisters we don't just say we do we really love them and a good test of that is whenever something happens and you see somebody in need that true compassion wells up in you when you have that compassion like Jesus had, whenever it just wells up in you, and you it wells up in you with the Spirit, and you can begin to pray fervently for someone's need because it's really sincere. You can only sincerely intercede for somebody you truly care about. This is a true test of the heart. Go ahead, come on. It's a true test of the heart whenever you go to pray for somebody and you really feel that compassion. When it's really real and you recognize that God's in it, God's moving, God's working in you, God's stirring you up, that God's going to move in that situation. You have faith that God's going to do it because you don't have a heart problem. Yeah, that's it.
said, my God, hallelujah, keep the ground plow, keep my heart right, hallelujah. And God will be work for us. Praise God. Sister Felicia had to say, what does Brother Thomas had to say, Brother Darren, said, that's him. Everyone testified, I enjoyed every bit of it. Praise God. I just want to see God do work here. And then I want to see souls saved. Appreciate Iron Hill coming to be with us. Yeah. New service. Praise God. Tomorrow night is uh, Brother Owsley is uh, having a youth service. We'll try to be there at 715. Uh, so we're going to have pizza afterwards. So get a chance to go. It's good fellowship. Praise yeah. God. Yeah. Good fellowship. Uh, is there any announcements? Somebody said something. Praise the Lord. Say what? Thursday and Sunday. Brother Darren, go ahead, brother. Yeah, we'd be glad if y'all could come there part with us, even if you wait until after your church and come on anyway. Yeah. Uh, that'd be great. We're going to have church starting at 11 o'clock. Yeah. Uh, we're going to have some food and stuff and Thanksgiving with friends. verse in the Bible that was read, Lord. I'm asking you, Lord, to minister to our hearts and our minds, Lord. Help us to draw closer to you, to serve you with all of our heart, Lord. To be ready to go when you call, Lord. Jesus, I thank you again for an opportunity and a seat in your house. And I ask you to keep your hand about us, keep us safe from harm, till we all meet again, Lord. In Jesus' precious name we pray, Lord. And we can be dismissed. In Jesus' name.